Blog Talk Radio. Bangthebook.com Welcome in everybody to the premier handicapping podcast on the planet. This is the Gridiron Gambling Report presented by bangthebook.com. I'm your host, Adam Burke. Joining me, as always, my super contest partner in crime, Bang the Book writer, personality, and football aficionado, Mr. Cole Ryan. Cole, how are you today, man? I'm doing fantastic. Are you kidding me? After a nice 4 and one week, last week in the super contest, we're back in the hunt. I'm very excited. I'm very excited as well. We had one of our rare off weeks uh, in previous week with a two and three. And, you know, I mean, really that's, that's the thing about this contest is it's all about consistency. Uh, you know, you can have a five and all oh week, but you cancel it out right away with a one and four or an oh and five. And fortunately, knock on wood, we haven't had any of those one and four or oh and five weeks to date yet, but you know, we bounced back nicely with a four and one. And uh, I think that makes us both a little bit more jovial on the podcast. Oh, certainly does. I mean, the, it's the, you know what it is? The competition's so tough that it seems like even guys who are clicking at 60% are still about 30 spots out. So, you know, even, you know, most guys would kill for a 58, 57% record, which is what we're sitting at right now at this point in the season, yet we're still far in the distance off from the uh, top spot on the leaderboard. Yeah, it's it's very very tough. It's it's certainly one of the toughest contests I've ever been a part of. But you know, I'm very happy to be a part of it. And we'll talk about the selections that we have nailed down so far uh, here in a couple of minutes. But you know, for those of you that are familiar uh, with our podcast at BankingBook.com, I have some exciting news for you. Uh, on November 10th, uh, Kyle Hunter and I will have our first handicapping the hardwood. That's our college basketball podcast. It's a week from Monday. So we're starting that off right away from week one. Last year, we didn't start until the end of college football season. So we're getting into that right away so that we can give you coverage throughout the season. And then obviously the college football podcast continuing to roll along on Wednesdays. Uh, But Cole, you do a lot of great things over at Bang the Book. One of them on Sunday mornings is the NFL Blitz. We like to pay homage to that with a podcast version of the NFL Blitz each week. Uh, where we just talk about some news and notes, injury things, some trends, uh, you know, recap the books from the previous weekend. Uh, you want to take a look first off this week at how teams are doing against the spread so far. Yeah, what I like to do is look, especially at the midway point, how teams overall are doing against the spread. It's really simple, but it often gets overlooked. So I broke it down into like a good, bad, and an ugly, just a quick, quick look. Um, as far as the good is concerned, it might be obvious to some that the Colts Six and two against the spread uh, this season. They just had their five game cover streak snapped against Pittsburgh, where they were a five and a half point favorite. Um, and the winner this week of the Arizona Dallas matchup will also have six wins against the spread. But it's funny that the Kansas City Chiefs have been the best team to bet this season, which, if you're just looking at the NFL as a whole, you wouldn't probably pay attention to that. They're five, one, and one against the spread. And uh, depending on your number, they literally haven't failed to cover in six straight games since their opening week loss to Tennessee. So, to me, taking a quick look at that good teams just shows people, wow, you know, Kansas City, at least when it comes to making money, it's having a great year. Well, I think it's really interesting when you talk about teams that have done extremely well against the spread. I mean, we see them in college football all the time, but you know, they tend to be some of the teams from weaker conferences, although uh, TCU undefeated against a number this season, and uh, they're certainly not from a weaker conference. But you know, the odds makers sometimes have a hard time catching up to those under-the-radar teams uh, in college football. They don't spend as much time on them because the betting handle isn't as big. But in the NFL, when you talk about teams that are doing really good against the number, that's certainly something you want to take notice of because this is the most efficient betting market in pro sports. Right, and that's why, you know, like with my bad teams against the spread, the Tennessee Titans and Jaguars 2-6 and six against the spread, and the Rams and Buccaneers 2-5 and five against the spread, and of course the ugly is that the New York Jets are just 1-6-1 one, and one against the spread. Again, depending on your closing line. But what what I think is unique and why I like to look at this is because teams will often go, well, if they're a really good team, then they're going to be good against the spread. Or if they're a really bad team, they're going to be bad against the spread. And sure, in some cases that holds true, but really not often enough uh, to make it a solid lock where if you have a good team, you got to bet them, especially when you get your Denver Broncos of the world that become, you know, big chalk as the season goes along. So I just think it's a quick something to take note of, just, a, you know, beginning a scratch to the surface of your handicapping some games just to see how teams are doing against the number. 
Well, I think it's hardly coincidental that the teams on your bad and ugly list have already either had quarterback issues or have altogether changed their starting quarterback. Yeah, see, another thing, and that's where you can start connecting the dots, right? Is it a quarterback issue, isn't it? When are they covering and when are they not covering? And, again, another thing I could connect in this uh, theory, especially just looking at the Jets, is turnovers, right? One six and one against the spread, and they're a turnover machine. So that's where you start, especially if you're new to handicapping. That's where you can start connecting the dots and trying to figure out what teams are good or bad. Well, a very interesting game this week between Washington and Minnesota. Interesting in part because Robert Griffin III reportedly going to be the starting quarterback for Washington this week, his first week back. And, you know, we could debate that. And uh, maybe it is something we'll bring up here in the Inside the Line segment uh, because, you know, Colt McCoy played very well last week for the Redskins. But the Vikings defense is something that we kind of pointed to early on in the season because we like the hire of Mike Zimmer, former Cincinnati Bengals defensive coordinator, as the head coach of the Vikings, and their defense has played very well this season so far. Right, and I wanted to focus on that in the Blitz because you're right. We did point this out, and we liked the Zimmer hire, and we thought it would have an effect on defense. Has it? Heck yeah. This was a group that allowed the most points in the NFL last season. They've improved to 17th overall, having allowed 173 points three games. That's impressive. Not super impressive, but impressive. But they fare even better in yards allowed, where they've gone from 31st in the league to 9th. And third down conversions where they've improved from 30th to 7th. So far, the Vikings have given up a first down on just 36% of third downs after failing to get off the field 44% of the time last year. You can see a huge improvement. And after sacking Mike Glennon five times last week, the Vikings now have 25 sacks, which ties them with the Jaguars for the second most in the league. That's an improvement that should not be overlooked. Well, and I think it's important to point out here, and, you know, context is always an important thing in the NFL because you can look at a box score and really see some misleading finals. But it's important to point out that 72 of the points that the Vikings have given up have come in two games. They gave up 30 to New England right after they found out Adrian Peterson wasn't going to be available. And they gave up 42 to Green Bay. That was a game sloppy in the rain following Teddy Bridgewater's sprained ankle, so he didn't play. So when you factor in what happened in those two games – Vikings defense has been even better than the statistics are suggesting. And I'm so glad you brought that up because so many people don't do that, whether it's betting trends or stats or numbers, they just take a blanket approach to it. And if you break it down, especially like you did right there, you can see where it really makes an impact because you can't forgive those two games. But, look, that Adrian Peterson thing was a big deal. Not having Bridgewater in the game against Green Bay is a big deal. Plus, they're going against Green Bay and Tom Brady. I mean, Green Bay and Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady and the Patriots, two of the best quarterbacks in the league. So that's important to look at, too. Well, no line out yet for the Arizona-Dallas game as everybody waits with bated breath on the status of Tony Romo. Uh, But there's a different injury for the Cowboys. In fact, it's the second time that this player has been injured. Uh, And that's one that we keyed in on a couple weeks ago when it first happened. And obviously we're going to mention it again because it's a big deal. Yeah, look. You're right. We nailed this one the first time. We're going to nail it again. Everybody can focus on Tony Roma. They should. It's pretty important. I get it. But the Cowboys lost linebacker and the team-leading tackler in Justin Durant. This guy is a sideline-to-sideline playmaker. Look, defensive coordinator Rod Marinelli, he said he's one of the most underrated players in the league. He tore biceps. He's done for the season. When he left the game Monday against Washington, you could see their skill players are more comfortable on the edges, and that's usually where Durant excelled in, uh, and covered. And I'm telling you, this loss is going to be huge. Now, some people might go, well, the last time they lost him, they still won football games without him in the lineup. He missed the games. Now, he's missed portions of the game, but the games he missed fully were the games against Tennessee Titans and the Rams. In those games, the Cowboys gave up 26 points to the Titans, 34 points to the Rams. These aren't the best offenses in the NFL, and they were skewered. Well, and also I remember that you mentioned that Durant, also their play caller on defense, he's the guy that relays the signals to everybody. So that's certainly a huge loss. And also, you you look at the Dallas Cowboys, their defense has been propped up by how good their offense has been, especially DeMarco Murray and how they've been able to control the clock. DeMarco Murray, already 206 carries on the season. If he starts to wear down, that's when we're going to see this Dallas defense get exposed. And a Durant injury, I mean, we're not talking about a week or two thing here. He's done for the season. That is a huge loss and one that's certainly not getting enough buzz because it's overshadowed by Romo. Well, and, you know, that's what media does. And Romo's a superstar, and that's how they cover it. But I really think if you're going to handicap games, 
That's the way you got to approach it. Kind of like you and I beat that drum about Dallas' defense not being all that great and the offense saving them. Well, we saw in that Monday night football game when the offense is not up to par, the defense gets into big trouble. It's going to be even worse without Durant in the lineup. Well, and as I mentioned, no line out yet for that Arizona-Dallas game, the Romo injury kind of holding that up. But what's the situation with Patrick Peterson? Well, the, Patrick Peterson was knocked out. He admitted he was knocked out after a hit by his teammate, uh, Deion Buchanan, who actually drove Eagles wide receiver Jeremy Macklin into Peterson. There was like a sandwich effect there. But a helmet to helmet, he concussion protocol. The good news is he passed concussion protocol. He's cleared for practice. He should be in the lineup this weekend. Deion Buchanan, that kid was an animal at Washington State. He was one of the few playmakers on that defense and certainly a heavy hitter. So, you know, and that's important, too, because I've been talking to you this week, and, uh, you know, it's it's a game that we're not going to be able to really cover because there's no line on it. But I've been talking to you this week about I think this is the first week that Tony Romo will have to win a game for Dallas. They've been doing it with the running game. And if Peterson's able to play, obviously he's a big-time playmaker in that Cardinals secondary. That's true. And we talked about Arizona's run defense just smothering. So it'll be fun to watch for sure. Well, another thing that we like to pay attention to in the blitz here and also during our game breakdowns are injuries in the trenches. And these are things that really don't get the attention that they deserve. I mean, skill players and quarterbacks move the line. Offensive linemen, linebackers, players of that sort really don't. Uh, but there's certainly a developing situation going on with the San Francisco 49ers. Yeah, and you and I love to dig in the trenches, and that's why we uncover stuff like Atlanta, Atlanta's demise with their problems, and uh, the Rams lately have some problems. 49ers, their starting center, Daniel Kilgore, he's done. He broke his ankle in the game against the Broncos. Um, they're going to have to turn to rookie Marcus Martin. Um, it's important for me that the 49ers had a bye because at least they got him in there, but the last time he played a snap for the 49ers was in the team's third exhibition game in August, late August, 24th to be exact. But more importantly, the projected starting offensive line for the 49ers has played all in one plus quarter together this season, which means they have no chemistry. And now they're putting a rookie in at center. That worries me even more. Now, luckily, they're playing a banged up Rams, but it's something to keep an eye on. Well, let's get in the inside line segment for this week. And, you know, uh, that in, the injuries on the offensive line for the 49ers don't seem to be affecting the betting public very much. That number is sitting at 10 right now. But the game that I first want to go to uh, for this week, because it's a game that we had a difference of opinion on, and, and I think it's an interesting line to read into, that's San Diego taking on Miami. You mentioned in the Blitz, I don't remember if it was this morning or yesterday morning, but talking about all the injuries that the San Diego Chargers have, not the Blitz, the money down, sorry about that, but all the injuries okay. that the San Diego Chargers have, taking the long trip here to Miami for the early kickoff, Miami opened a one-and-a-half point favorite. The betting markets pushed it up to two-and-a-half, uh, and I know that you agree with this line move. I do. I do. And I, and I, I won't be as bold to call it a sharp move, but I'm thinking it is. Um, I, the public loves San Diego. They love Philip Rivers. Those injuries, to me, may cause a move, but for the most part, there's not really big names if you're just a regular fan of the league. Now, if you dig in deep, Brian Matthews is the biggest name, game, and, name, and we'll talk about more later when we cover the game. But I really think the push is how well Miami's playing, plus they're at home. Although they played a timid schedule that could be questioned, I think it's a sharp move here. Well, look at another line move then, uh, and that's going to be this Washington-Minnesota game, not a game that we're going to talk about. And, and really the line move is just because of where it opened. Um, you look at this game, and, and it took a little while for a line to come out because it looked like RG3 was going to be able to go. Uh, now this game is mostly sitting at pick across the market. A little bit of Washington money has come in at some of the books you know, what do you make of this line? I, I think it's a pretty strange line, to be honest with you. Well, I, you know, let me ask you this, Forrest. What, what do you think it would have been at if RG3 was healthy coming into this without a change during the week? Hmm. Uh, well, it, it depends. Does RG3 beat Dallas last weekend? Yeah, you know, and that's what I mean. There's a lot of variables going on in this game. What I really think it shows to me, at least this early, there's still plenty of the time uh, time for this line to move more, is that RG3 really isn't a point mover to me. You know what I mean? If you – now, uh, Tom Brady, Drew Brees, if those guys are out and then come in, we're talking probably two, three points, maybe more, depending on who they're playing. 
but it really hasn't moved a lot. And I thought it was kind of telling that the Vikings were a favorite, even with the Colt McCoy in there after that big upset. But now it's starting to move just a shade towards Washington, and I'm anxious to see how far it goes towards Washington with the talk of RG3 playing this week. Yeah, and of course there was a letdown spot built into the line, and that's another variable that you have to consider here. Also Washington on the short week, uh, which is yet another variable to consider. And the sure. Super Contest line was Minnesota minus 2.5, which I believe came out j- shortly before RG3 was confirmed as the starter. So if you go from from that standpoint, you could argue that the books that waited put a 2.5-point adjustment, 1.5 to 2.5-point adjustment on RG3, uh, that surprises me a little bit. I'm not sure how, uh, you know, I'm not sure how his timing is going to be. And don't forget too, when he got hurt, everybody talked about how Kirk Cousins was a better fit for this offense. Well, Cousins has since been benched, so I, I really don't know what to make of the whole situation. It, it's a very confusing number. Yeah, it's a tough game. A lot of variables. Because you're right, Griffin was starting to get better in that system, but he still wasn't there yet. And do you believe in the Redskins? Plus, those variables you talked about, short week, letdown, a lot of stuff going on in this game, a lot of noise. So you really got to focus in and figure out what's going on. A couple of the other interesting line moves of the week we're going to talk about a little bit more in depth. Uh, But we're going to start off by talking about the Super Contest here. And we we really don't have a strong card to this point. Uh, We do have one pretty solid consensus play. We're also looking at another one. Uh, but the one that we have pretty much locked down, looks like we're going to go with the Jacksonville Jaguars this week. Uh, this will be the third time in four weeks, I believe, that we go with the Jags. They're an 11-point dog at Cincinnati. And this is a Jaguars team that's really improving, but they didn't get much credit for it in the line this week. No, and you know why? To me, there's a lot of things uh, that was misleading about their last game against Miami. Late in the first half, the Jaguars had actually outgained Miami 199 yards to four uh, and overall, they outgained Miami by 51 yards in the game. It was Bortles who threw two pick six uh, interceptions for touchdowns, which was the difference in this game. But overall, it's a bad spot for Cincinnati. And we talk about bad spots a lot. Um, and so, th- to me, this is one of them. They just beat the Ravens. It was a last-second emotional win, which they thought they lost on a Steve Smith play. They ended up winning. They have Cleveland on deck after this. This almost seems like a bye week for these guys, and all of a sudden they're a double-digit favorite, which, by the way, since 2011 and Andy Dalton, the Bengals have never been favorites of 10 or more points, so this is strange territory for them. You throw in the fact that Pro Bowl linebacker uh, Fontes Berthet will miss Sunday's game. He's going to miss two weeks. He got uh, surgery, and Marvin Lewis talked about that. And plus they have a lot of weaknesses that people don't really talk about. I mean, their run defense – Cincinnati is tied with five teams for the third highest numbers of rushing touchdowns allowed this season at eight. All eight of the rushing scores the Bengals have allowed have come inside the red zone, and only the Falcons, who are awful, have allowed more rushing scores inside their own 20. Since their week three win against Tennessee, the Bengals have allowed an average of 158 yards per game on the ground. Across that same stretch, the league has allowed an average of 110 yards per game. But everybody's going to go, the Jags can't run the ball. That's changing. And I want to give you credit because you said they may have found somebody in Denard Robinson, and this guy's a speedster. They can run him in different options, whether it's pitches or or anything, really. And and he's the first guy. He's posted consecutive 100-yard rushing games, becoming the first Jacksonville player to do that since NJD in 2011. I love the points in this, this situation. Give me double digits. Give me the Jaguars. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm going to take that one as well. I really like that play. And like you said, I mean, it falls into a, a tough spot. It's a divisional sandwich for Cincinnati. Uh, as you said, not a whole lot of incentive to go out there and blow out Jacksonville. I, I think this is one of those games where you, you kind of hope to cruise to a win and get out of it healthy. Don't forget, they play Thursday night against Cleveland. So short week coming up there as well. you got to wonder if maybe they put a little bit of Cleveland prep into the, the game plan this week. Really wouldn't surprise me. And when you look at how the Bengals have performed over the last four weeks, uh, you know, I know they picked up that win against Baltimore last week, but this doesn't strike me as a team that's capable of blowing anybody out right now. And you're talking about a big number, double digit dogs tend to do pretty well in the NFL. And this Jacksonville team is very scrappy. They didn't play particularly well last week, and they were still in that game, especially statistically. Uh, you talked about the Bortles pick sixes that really made a difference. I really like what I've seen from the Jags here. The defense is playing hard. The skill players are rallying around Bortles. And I think it's a bounce-back week for Bortles here to prove something against a pretty decent 
albeit not statistically, Cincinnati Bengals defense. Yeah, and I watched some of those pick sixes. Those are coachable. Um, and inadvisable throws, which whether you have taken, have them take a sack in that situation or throw it away, that's stuff that can be fixed with coaching. The Bengals will probably get A.J. Green back. At least he'll have a chance. He participated in practice Wednesday. It's the first time he's done it in nearly a month. My guess is even if he's ready, they're not going to push him because they want to make sure he's 100%. So maybe he'll get less snaps plus a few systems uh, fit into this play. Since 2004, teams that lost by 14 or more points the previous week and are underdogs of nine or more points, 87, 61, and three against the spread. That's a big sample size for me, and that's 59%. Plus, all te- all time teams that start the season one and seven and are dogs of 10 or more points, 12, six, and one against the spread. Love the Jacks. It was our first pick this week. We we hit it right away. Yeah, we did. Uh, and you know, there are a couple of other big underdogs on the card this week that we're kind of sorting through. Uh, but a small underdog, a small home dog that we really like this week is the Houston Texans. Uh, this line kind of piqued my interest right away when I first saw it because I'm not going to say that the wrong team is favored, but I think this game really should have opened closer to a pick. Uh, but Houston, home dog, two points in the Super Contest, uh, and we're on board with the Texans this week. Yeah, we are, and I was like you. Uh, you know, I like this li- line early. We kind of circled this game early. Darren Sproles should be back. Uh, he expects to play this weekend against the Texans. That'll be good for the Eagles, but they're sloppy right now. And think about this. The Jets' Geno Smith has turned the ball over 12 times this season, which is crazy, right? But you know who else has turned the ball over that much? Nick Foles. Foles has thrown seven interceptions in the Eagles' past four games, and things aren't going to get any easier. J.J. Watt, Clowney's at full strength. He'll be back. And he's another player who commands attention. Even in his limited role last week, Clowney only played 32 snaps against the Titans. He drew double teams. That's going to be a recipe for disaster. Plus, I'm telling you, the Texans' offense is starting to click. If they can get their running game going against Philadelphia's 21st-ranked run defense, not only can they limit turnovers, they can control the clock, they'll be in great shape. The Texans' rushing yards per game in October is the highest in the NFL at 164 yards per game, which is even better than the Cowboys and DeMarco Murray will rush for 156 yards per game. Give me the Texans. I really like this play a lot. And you look at it, Philadelphia is coming off of a pretty good performance, actually, at Arizona. They outgained them by 121 yards, uh, 10 more first downs in that game. They were 9 of 20 on third down. So they, they really ironed some things out during the bye week. But guess what? They still lost. And that's all that matters in the NFL. This is a bottom line league. And the bottom line is the Eagles didn't win last week. So here they are going back out on the road again. A long trip to Arizona, pretty lengthy trip to Houston now. And obviously Jadavian Clowney being back for his second game is, is an important thing. He was able to get back into the flow of things, you know, get his uh, snap timing down and those sorts of things. And, and we've talked about it on this show before, and you keyed in on Nick Foles a lot early in the season with how much he was struggling to throw with pressure and we know J.J. Watt and Jadavian Clowney are going to get in that backfield. And Foles is going to make mistakes or he's going to have to throw balls away. And uh, I think that really short circuits the Philadelphia offense here. Give me Houston because I like what their running game is doing. I, I like that you mentioned that because they can control the tempo of this game. They can keep that Eagles offense on the sideline. And this is a Philadelphia team that's really lived off of defensive and special teams turnovers this year. Sure, that could be the case this week. If we get beat by something fluky like that, I think I'm going to wind up being okay with it because I think Houston's going to be the better team here. Sure. And, you know, I talked about this in the money down this week too. Foles, what he was doing is almost admirable because he was trying to avoid getting sacked so much. This offensive line has been patchwork. He's had to do it on his own or at least try. So to try and avoid all these sacks, he's thrown off his back foot. He's trying to force plays. They're causing interceptions. I really think the coaching staff says, hey, don't worry about that because you're going to get us turnovers. You might even see more sacks because of it. But on the flip side, you know, Ryan Fitzpatrick is the quarterback of the Texans. He doesn't get a lot of uh, credit because, of course, Arian Foster is that offense. But he's a very mistake-free, smart quarterback. He's got a 63.4 completion percentage. He's had four games without any interceptions. And typically he doesn't take sacks that will cause too much lost yardage. Um, so he's a smart quarterback running this team. They'll focus on running the ball, put a lot of pressure on that offense. And since Chip Kelly's been the Eagles, they're not good in the favorite role. Just six and ten against the spread. Love the Texans. Well a game that we're 
not entirely sold on to this point, but I do want to mention it here uh, because we really don't see numbers like this in the NFL. Uh, that's the Oakland Raiders plus 15 taking on Seattle this week. I know you're kind of wavering back and forth about this game. I, I've got a pretty strong conviction on it. I'll see if I'm able to talk you into it. Uh, but, you know, it's it's amazing to me that the way the Seahawks have played, uh, that they would be over a two-touchdown favorite against anybody right now. Yeah, you know, that's the thing. That's the thing. And we have talked about this game a little bit because right away, in fact, we both said, hey, we like the Raiders, we like the Jags. And and my concern from a contest standpoint is you don't want too many bad teams out there, although we think there's value, especially in this big line. But Seahawks, they really need a statement game. The problem is the Raiders have been playing everybody close. Seattle every week seems to have a different distraction, whether it's Percy Harvin being traded, Marshawn Lynch not welcome back next year. They're trying out new things on offense. Their defense has holes everywhere. Their defense has injuries everywhere. Meanwhile, the Raiders aren't winning, but they sure are keeping things interesting. It wasn't until the second half last week that Cleveland actually pulled away from them. Um, Derek Carr is becoming a very good quarterback at a young age. They can put some talent around him, and they already have a wide receiver. They can move the ball. They can keep this game close. It's just a matter of playing in Seattle. That's kind of keeping me off this at the moment, although I like to see that that line is growing. Um, Not that we'll get it because we have a stale line, but you mentioned this earlier that uh, teams, double-digit underdogs, do well in the NFL. Since 2004, all underdogs have 10 or more points. 200-156-3 and against the spread. That's 56%. I like the Raiders in this game. I'll take the points. Just not sure if I'm ready to make it a contest pick yet. Well, I think it was important to talk about this game to illustrate uh, the mindset that we have, what we go through when we make these super contest plays. I know we kind of shed a little bit of light on it last week, but, you know, with, with the way that we talk about games, how we talk about line value, how I know you're big on underdogs and not laying a whole lot of chalk, you get one of these numbers that's over two touchdowns, and it seems like it's almost an autoplay. And yet here we are having some reservations about it. And you know, it wouldn't surprise me if this was a not a consensus play necessarily because I think there are a lot of squares in the contest that aren't taking Oakland at any price. But sure. this is a game you will see a lot of people select. Uh, and you know, I'm kind of curious if that's something that you also want to avoid. Well, you know, what I want to avoid avoid is is being complacent, is just going, okay, this has worked before, so let's keep doing it without really digging in. And fortunately for you and I, uh, we live football. We do it every day, whether it's an article or we're just chatting or emailing or on the phone. We talk about football nonstop, so we don't do that. But to me, it's important. We went two and three, and the first thing that you and I said is, let's see what we did. Let's do something a little different. Let's mix it up. Let's find a new way to go over the games and look at it. Same thing here. Look, I saw this spread and loved it, too. I was like, man, the Raiders, they've been playing people tough, and here we go. But then I went, well, let me take a second look here because Seattle's at home. To me, they need a statement game. I think they need a game where people go, yep, they are the defending champs. Yep, they're the best team in the league. Because right now, people are thinking that the Arizona Cardinals are better than Seattle. So, to me, Oakland kind of folding, for lack of a better term, in that second half against Cleveland has me concerned because that was the first time this season I've kind of seen that give up in this team, which you don't want to see in any team, especially when you're getting points. So, like the Raiders do, if the game was today, I'd be playing them. I'm just not sure if they're contest worthy. Well, and this game illustrates a point that all of our listeners need to take to heart, and that's if you can't make a case for taking the other side, the side that you don't like, you probably shouldn't take the side that you do like because you're not looking at the game objectively. You're not looking at it from every angle. And that's important to do in the NFL because if a line looks too good to be true, it generally is. So definitely make it a point each week as you're going through these games, you know, you start going through your leans list, start looking at it from the other side as well and and see if you can make a case for the team that you're, that you have a lean to go against because you're really doing yourself a disservice and probably missing out on something that you should be able to see. So with that, only a couple of consensus plays for us in the super contest for the podcast so far. Uh, Obviously you'll be able to get our full card either on Twitter or uh, Sunday morning in the NFL blitz that Cole Ryan does over at the bang the book forums. Uh, Sorry, we don't have more for you than that, but you know, I mean, we're, we're really getting into the thick of things here. And it's something we want to make sure that we're meticulous about 
Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about this San Diego Miami game and how interesting the line is. And so we want to spend a little bit more time on it because, you know, oftentimes you get these West coast teams heading East and it seems like they're an auto fade. Uh, and, and I'm not so sure. And it looks like you're on, on the side of the dolphins. So I think we should talk a little bit more about the methodology that we're both going through here. Sure. And, and I'll also throw in a little, little disclaimer Sunday night, if not definitely Monday morning, you and I have already tossed a few names out there of teams that we like. And Sunday night, this was my top play. I was like, that's the play I want. Uh, this is it. Now, since then, the disclaimer is that the picks that we throw out on Sunday often change by Friday when we go, yep, I want the exact opposite. So that happens a lot with us. But for me, I like the way that the Dolphins are playing. Granted, they beat up on some also ran some last place teams. Um, but I like the fact that the Chargers are hurting. I mean, Brandon Flowers, Ryan Matthews, Manti Teo, uh, Jason Verrett. I mean, the list goes on and on. They didn't have eight players practice. It, it looks like Franey, who also didn't practice, will play. I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, Ryan Matthews there. But to me, Brandon Flowers probably won't. Um, everything I'm seeing say, says he won't. Donald Brown probably will be back. That helps him out. But there's a couple other things that really catch my eye. This is more X's and O's. Chargers not taking care of business when it comes to stopping the rush. Um, they let up 139 yards uh, to the Broncos, 154 yards to the Chiefs. The Dolphins' offense, new coordinator Bill Lazor has done a good job of spreading out defenses by calling run plays at the right time. He's got a nice read option with Tannehill and Mill. It's been a huge success. They're ranked number six in the run game by averaging 138 yards rushing per game. I think X and O wise, that works out for him. So for that reason, and a few others, I like the Dolphins in this game. I think this is such a tough game to pick because you look at San Diego, and, and admittedly, I, like, I really liked San Diego off the top. But, you know, as you said, as we go throughout the week and start looking at things a little bit more, uh, opinions kind of change. But San Diego's got a nice win over Seattle, a strong win at Buffalo, and they beat Jacksonville, the Jets, and Oakland. Last two weeks, they've lost to Kansas City and Denver. So they step up in competition, they come up short. However, those were two very bad spots for the Chargers. They were coming off of a, a pretty lackluster effort at Oakland when Kansas City came to town. Kansas City off a of bye week. Andy Reid, historically very strong off the bye. Chiefs were able to take advantage. Short week at Denver. We kind of saw that one coming uh, as San Diego lost by two touchdowns. On the flip side, Miami coming off of back-to-back -back road wins against a Chicago team that's a complete dumpster fire right now. And a Jacksonville team that arguably was better than Miami in that game. They just gave up a couple pick sixes. So in the what for you, what have you done for me lately category, neither one of these teams really meets the mark for me. No, and, you, and you, I will agree with you on that. I, I just think I really like, let's face it, Phil Rivers is the San Diego Chargers offense. Already thinking that the Dolphins can move the ball against this defense. The Dolphins are number three in passing defense. That's unbelievable because you wouldn't know that just by looking at their team and who they played. But the old teams are just 212 passing yards of the game. And to me, their strength is – the Miami's front four are the strength of the entire team. They have waves of good players. They just keep rotating them out, whether it's defensive end, Cameron Wake, and Oliver Vernon, or bringing in other guys, Earl Mitchell, Randy Starks. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. The bench chips in. Deion Jordan is back. He recorded a couple tackles in his first game off suspension. He'll be full speed this week. Plus, Miami's next four opponents have a combined record of 22-9, and nine, which means we're going to find out if the Dolphins are contenders or pretenders right now. To me, that makes this game even more important because they have to keep going in a positive direction. Two of San Diego's three losses this week on the road. And plus, the special teams – I'm a little shaky on their special teams. They have one of the worst return units in the league. San Diego averages a league worth 16 yards per kick, and the Chargers are tied for 20th in the NFL in punt returns, averaging 7.1 yards. That, to me, is a recipe for good field position for the Chargers and a win for the Miami Dolphins. Well, we'll move to a game in the 4 o'clock time slot here, and, and this is clearly the best game of the week. And, in fact, this one, I before we even started saying anything about our loons for the Super Contest, I said I'm not touching this game. I don't even want to think about this game. It, it is the <laughs> furthest game from my radar for our Super Contest plays. That's the Denver Broncos at the New England Patriots. And, and you got the two best quarterbacks in the league with Peyton Manning and Tom Brady here. Uh, although I guess you could make a case for Andrew Luck, given the MVP caliber season that he's having. 
but these are two teams that have hit a, a pretty good groove right now. I, I know the Patriots had trouble with the Jets on Thursday night a couple weeks ago. Could have lost that game if not for the blocked field goal. But these are two offenses that are playing at a very high level right now. Oh, you ain't kidding. And look, this, this game – is littered with storylines. First of all, the battle of the quarterbacks, Brady versus Manning, you'll you'll hear that. It, it'll make you nauseous how many times you'll hear that. But a win for the Patriots would run the Patriots' record of 3-1 and one against the Broncos since Peyton Manning went to Denver. But really, what we care about is the spread, right? And and Tom Brady, against Tom Brady, Peyton Manning 6-9-1 and one against the spread in his career. Another thing to keep an eye on is that Gillette Stadium expects freezing temperatures, high winds, and even snow in the forecast. So you're also going to hear a lot about Manning, who has an 8-11 career record in games where the kickoff temperature is below 40. The home team has won all three of the previous meetings in this one. Uh, New England's win had come in the regular season where the Broncos have been winning uh, or won the AFC championship game. So the Patriots have a little bit of a revenge factor coming in. What I think is interesting is a few stats. The Patriots come in 10th with 257 yards per game on offense. The Broncos are third. That's not a surprise, right? The Broncos have a high-power offense. We get it. However, New England's defense is second in the league against the pass, while Denver is just 17th. To me, that speaks volumes. Again, like you, when I saw this game, I went, man, I can't wait to watch it, but I don't want to go anywhere near it when it comes to the Super Contest, especially with that line being the Broncos, a three-point favorite on the road. I think that's really going to tempt a lot of Patriot uh, backers getting the Patriots at home. I mean, think about it. A win this week would improve the Patriots' record at 12-5 and five straight up and 14-3 and three against the spread as home underdogs since Bill Belichick has taken over. This is going to be one heck of a game. Yeah, it absolutely is. It's hard to go against the hoodie as a home dog. There's, there's no question about that. Uh, you know, and I'll bring I'll play a devil's advocate point here on that passing yard. I mean, context is important here. Denver has several blowouts this season. Uh, they were blowing out Indianapolis early in that game and kind of let them creep back in. Uh, you look at the quarterbacks that Denver's faced. You know, Andrew Luck is in there, Alex Smith, Russell Wilson, although he's having a down year. Uh, Philip Rivers last week. New England's faced Ryan Tannehill. I believe what was it? Uh, was that Castle in the game against Minnesota? <laughs> I believe so. It was before it was Bridgewater. You know, the last three weeks, Orton, uh, whoever is at quarterback now for the New York Jets, I don't even know if it's Marcus Vick or Mike Vick. Uh, and then Chicago, their offense is kind of a train wreck right now. Uh, their skill players not really holding up their end. They've also been dinged up. So New England really hasn't faced a whole lot of premier quarterbacks to this point in the season. That partially explains a little bit about the passing defense. However, I will give them credit because they've certainly had their share of injuries back there that they've had to contend with. Sure. And, and look, I'll give credit to the Broncos, too. First of all, it's Peyton Manning. Uh, it's always hard to go against Peyton Manning. But John Fox coach teams, 19-12-1 and one against the number and 24-8 and eight overall as road favorites. The Broncos are also 10-3 and three against the spread as road favorites of three points or more with Manning under center. So they're used to this position. They're not intimidated by it. They know how to handle it. What I really like to talk about is the third down, which, of course, is the money down. Patriots have improved in this category. They were just 19th overall in converting third downs, and that's 41% uh, to start the season. But over the past three games, they've dramatically turned that around. They've converted 46%, 46%, and 63% in the last three games. Overall, the Broncos have let opponents convert 20 third down situations of third and six or more to go with one conversion on a fourth and six. That total includes nine conversions on third and 10 and or more and three on third and 18 or more. So if they can keep moving the sticks on key third downs, it could be a long game. But I can't wait to watch Gronk versus Tlaib. I think that will be a great matchup. Tlaib shut down Jimmy Graham when he faced him, but Gronk is much more physical. Plus, Broncos strong safety, T.J. Ward, as you know, used to be with the Browns. He cut down Gronkowski last year in week 14 with a helmet to knee blow. Tore his right ACL and MCL. He's not apologizing for anything. This game could get a little ugly. Can't wait to watch it. Yeah, TJ Ward, pretty cheap player when he was here, too. Uh, remember a couple of weeks ago, or I guess it was more than a couple of weeks ago, about a month ago after that Kansas City loss when people were saying that, that Belichick had uh, been drowned out by the players and that you know Tom Brady might need to sit down for Jimmy Garoppolo? Remember when that happened? Yeah, I do remember that. I do. Yeah, well, what a mess. <laughs> I mean, they, they've certainly put any thoughts of that to rest. And, I mean, really, those thoughts should have been put to rest immediately after they came out of somebody's mouth. But 
man, what a great game this is going to be. And uh, I guess the last point to ask you about this game, is this an AFC championship preview? Uh, yes. I said a little reluctantly because Andrew Luck can carry the Colts. I'm not a buyer in the Colts, never have been. I am a buyer in Andrew Luck. He's got to carry the Colts. Plus, the AFC North, as ugly as they are, as far as winning games going up, going down, they've got a you know a division that's all over 500. So somebody's going to be very competitive there. So I will say yes, but I, I, I'm not completely convinced in that yes. It's a half-hearted yes. Well, you just mentioned the AFC North, and that's where we're going to go. The Sunday night game here, Baltimore at Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh coming off of a very impressive offensive showing against the Colts, 51 points, 639 yards. Ben Roethlisberger was outstanding in that game. Uh, however, we're seeing a line move against the Steelers this week. They're up to a two-point home underdog after this game hovered pick early in the week. Uh, first things first, are you surprised by this line move? A little bit, a little bit, because – you and I talk about it, and you just kind of hit on it when you were teasing a little bit about the Patriots. Overreaction is, is king in this business. And after the Steelers beat the Colts and, and Ben Roethlisberger had a monster day, I thought it was going to be straight out all money on Pittsburgh, especially since um, the Ravens lost to the Bengals. So they're coming in kind of limping. Pittsburgh also lost 26-6 to at Baltimore in Week 2. I thought more people would take that into account. Maybe it's the fact that Jimmy Smith, cornerback for the Ravens, would be out for this game, which is, is something to watch uh, for as well because there's going to be a whole different set of defensive schemes that the Ravens may pull out. I also want to focus on the cornerback, Cortez Allen, who's a fourth-year corner for the Steelers, who's trying to battle his way out of a slump that has led to a pair of demotions in the last two weeks. They've pulled him last two weeks. He's been called for at least one penalty in seven consecutive games. But unlike the usual um, smash mouth kind of game you get with these two teams. I think it could be the opposite this week where offenses kind of rule the roost. But don't expect a big game from Roethlisberger. In 15 meetings with the Ravens, Roethlisberger has won 300-yard passing game and has thrown more than touch, two touchdowns in a game just once. The Ravens have beat him, beaten him in four of the five last five meetings, recording as many interceptions at five as touchdowns allowed at five. His passer rating against the Ravens since 2011 is an extremely mediocre 78.2. I'm going to take the Ravens here. Truth be told, I think they're a better team. While the Steelers' offense is admirable, their defense is awful. The defense of the Ravens is much better. Flacco's having a great season. He's comfortable in that offense. Give me Baltimore. Well, you know, I, I kind of had a perception of the Steelers, and I've wanted to go against them the last two weeks in the contest, and, and luckily you guys kept me from that uh, as they've beaten Houston and Indianapolis in the last two weeks. I really thought Pittsburgh was a terrible team after that loss to the Browns, and it's not just because they lost to the Browns. It's because they hadn't played well up to that point. Uh, they played well in the first half against the Browns in the season opener, and that was about it. And, you know, I, I really had a negative perception of Pittsburgh, and – it's kind of interesting now that mine's kind of going up a little bit, whereas yours is coming down. I mean, I haven't been a believer in the Steelers' defense all year long. They're very long in the tooth back there, especially in the secondary. However, you look at this game, Joe Flacco significantly better at home than he is on the road. Back-to-back -back road games for Flacco. Wasn't able to get the job done last week against the Bengals. Why would he be able to get the job done this week? Well, you know, I really like how they've improved in the red zone. The Ravens have been had been the best, uh, the ninth best red zone offense over the past three games. That's a big difference from being number 28 the first five weeks of the season. After only scoring touchdowns on eight of the first 20 trips inside the 20, the Ravens reached end zone on nine of the last 13 drives. I also think there's a big mismatch in that secondary. You talked about it. Um, I really think Tory Stiff Smith and Steve Smith can almost have a field day in the secondary. The run can mix it up. I also really, really like C.J. Mosley on the Ravens' defense. Uh, he's a young linebacker they drafted. 73 tackles, tied for the team lead with two interceptions. He's a strong candidate for me, at least, for rookie of the year. Plus, this is going to be a close game, right? They both hate each other, so let's give some credit to a position we don't. How about the kicker, Justin Tucker, the Ravens? He's hit six straight, including ones from 15 and 53. They're not afraid to let this guy kick. Uh, he has six attempts from 50 or longer, which is tied with Atlanta's Matt Bryant for the most in the NFL. Tucker has converted 10 of his 11 last field goal tries and has only missed with a 64-yarder that got blocked, 18 of 21 on the season. I'm telling you, in a close game, you give me a clutch kicker, 
and I'll take Flacco. Look, I think the Ravens have the Steelers figured out, and I think it's really a head game at this point. And plus, I think the coaching edge goes to Baltimore. That's why I'm on the Ravens. We got just a couple seconds left streaming live. If you are listening live, please download the podcast to hear a rapid fire rundown at the end of the show. Uh, good point about Tucker as well. Heinz Field, a very tough place to kick historically. Uh, I had another point to make, and, and now I forgot it. Um, hopefully, it'll come to me. But uh, I, I think this is going to be a very interesting game. I think it's a good measuring stick for both teams because Baltimore needs to bounce back. And Pittsburgh possibly overachieving a little bit right now. And, and the AFC North very much up for grabs. Cincinnati nowhere near as strong as I thought they were going to be. So it was certainly a big game for both teams. And, you know, I, I'm curious to see which one of them comes out on top. Uh, any final thoughts you wanted to add about the Sunday Nighter? Are you there? I think I'm oh, losing you. You're breaking the... out on me. Oh, that's... That's not good. Good time for that to happen right here. Nope, I got show. you back. Absolutely. I got you back. Oh, there go we go. It. Good. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm, I'm glad you're back on. I don't, maybe it was something about cutting off the live stream. I'm not sure. Uh, I said, did you have any final thoughts on that Sunday night primetime game? No, I think it will be a good game to watch. I think it's good for the schedule. I think between the Patriots game and then going into the L.A. game, it's going to be a good uh, Sunday afternoon. But that's all I got. Well, unfortunately, we can't spend too much time on the Thursday nighter because it's already five, almost 5.30 Eastern, so not a whole lot of people are going to get too many of our thoughts on that game. But we're going to mention it here in the Rapid Fire Rundown anyway. New Orleans, minus three at Carolina. Some New Orleans teams come in. This one up from one and a half to three with the Saints road chalk. Yeah, D'Angelo Williams back for the Panthers. Saints 0-4-2 against the number. Three and three straight up on Thursday night games under Sean Payton. I'll take the Panthers. I really don't know where to go with this game. The Saints looked a lot better last week, obviously, but we know Drew Brees, much different guy in the dome. I guess if I'm getting the the line value of a you know, plus three even money or plus three plus money, I'll take Carolina, but not a very strong lean either way for me. We already talked about Philadelphia and Houston. Houston going to be a super contest pick, as well as Jacksonville taking on Cincinnati. Uh, the Cleveland Browns, six and a half point favorites against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Yeah, you know, what Cleveland Browns team are you going to get? You know, the one that was close in the first half or the one that, you know, blew them out in the second half against the Raiders, that is. Or, and on the flip side, what kind of team are you going to get Tampa Bay here? I think this number's still a little too big. I know Tampa Bay um, lost to Minnesota in a game they should have won. They're trading players. I think that might wake up a few people. I know the trade deadline has passed, but it kind of sends a message to me. Plus, uh, they get some key players back this week. Um, I like... Tampa in this one, road underdogs have won 25% or less of the games after a stretch of five games where they've been beaten by the spread of 42 or com- more combined points or 34 and 10 against the spread over the last 10 years. To me, that means they're due for a good game, and I'll take the points. I'm going to take the points as well. I, I like Tampa Bay to keep this game close, as, as ugly of a pick as it is. Uh, the Browns have major problems in the trenches, especially in the offensive line. They have had no running game to speak of the last couple weeks. Uh, and, and that Tampa Bay Buccaneers front, it's young, but it's improving. And, and Gerald McCoy, a big part of the reason why, I think they stopped the running game. And um, I think they're able to hang around in this one. So I'll, I'll take Tampa Bay in the points. The Jets, plus nine and a half at Kansas City. Uh, not a whole lot of uh, excitement about this game, but who are you going to take? Nah, I, you know, I like the fact that the name Michael Vick to start early uh, in the week. That gives them time to get uh, reps with the first team. Plus, what's very interesting is I found this out. The Jets have had 20 drives of at least 10 plays on offense, which is good enough to be tied uh, with the Pats for the league lead. That means they can mount some offensive drives. they just got to stop turning over the ball. There's no proof they can do that, but I think this line's a tad inflated. I'll reluctantly take the Jets. I think I'm going to have to take Kansas City. I think the Jets are really just counting down the weeks until the bye uh, Mike Vick, it, it's nice that he's named the starter, and he's probably more of a leader than Geno Smith, but I don't think Mike Vick has anything left in the tank. Uh, so I think I'm going to take the Chiefs. I'll lay the big number and and hope that the Jets continue to be the Jets. We talked at length about San Diego and Miami. Unfortunately, uh, you know what? I guess we can go with a pick on Arizona-Dallas. Super contest line is Dallas minus three and a half. Yeah, scary, scary stuff here for me, too. I still need to figure out a few things. But the Cowboys, 0-3 straight up, 1-2 against the number after Monday night game. 
Uh, last night in that game, they missed a season-high 12 tackles, sloppy defense. We talked about Durant not being there. Cowboys had problems with that blitz against Washington. Well, guess what? This week they get the Cards who blitz 47% of the time, which is good for the highest percentage in the NFL. They're doing well, which is amazing, considering they're playing with just two players from the front seven of the Cardinals from a year ago. I'm going to take the Cardinals in this game. I'm going to take the Cardinals as well. I really like the Cardinals in this spot, actually. It's one I may lobby for a little bit more in the Super Contest. Uh, The Durant injury is a big deal for Dallas to me. Uh, also, Tony Romo, whether he's whether he plays or not, he's not healthy. He really hasn't been healthy since the preseason. I think that back is still an issue. Arizona's going to come after him. Their pass defense is kind of all or nothing. Where if they don't get to the quarterback, they're giving up yards. But this is the week that DeMarco Murray should get stopped, which, as I said at the top of the show, means that Tony Romo's got to win the game for the Cowboys. I don't think he's in a position to do that right now. Give me Arizona. I'll take the points. I'm also going to take him out right here. Uh, nice. Washington at Minnesota, going to go with pick for this game. We talked about the injury situation with RG3 coming back. Uh, what do you think about this game? Uh, truth be told, this is one of the games that I actually look forward to watching a little bit. Reunion between between uh, former Cincinnati Bengals coordinator. We talked about Mike Zimmer. Offensive coordinator Jay Gruden uh, was with the Bengals as well. So the chess match alone will be good to see. But short week, let down for the Redskins. The Redskins following the Monday night game of the road are 7-10-1 against the spread. That's just 41%. Minnesota defense is playing fantastic. Teddy Bridgewater is coming along. Give me the Vikings. I'm going to take the Vikings here as well. And I think an underrated thing that you you sort of alluded to regarding the coaching chess match is that this is going to be Jay Gruden's first crack on a short week as a head coach. And I think that's a problem. I think there's an adjustment to be made as a head coach. I mean, you know, if you're just talking about being an offensive coordinator on a short week, a little bit different than being the head coach on a short week. So uh, I think Gruden gets out coached a little bit this week. I really like Zimmer, and I really like the Vikings defense. Give me the Vikings in that one. Uh, St. Louis plus 10 at San Francisco. Uh, this has a combination of things I don't like. Uh, double-digit shock in the 49ers. Offensively, it's a great <laughs> matchup, though. The Rams' biggest problem has been stopping the run. St. Louis ranks 31st out of 32, giving up an average of 144 yards a game. Uh, they were able to limit the 49ers 89 yards in that first meeting of Monday Night Football, but it was at home. Um, the 49ers are coming off a bye. Everybody and anybody seems to be hurt for uh, the Rams from offensive line to wide receiver to secondary issues. They made trades to try to help that. I like Jeff Fisher as a coach. I really think he can work miracles. A lot of systems in favor of St. Louis this week, but there's some other stuff going against him this week. I, truth be told, this game is a pass to me, but – if I'm going to pick it, which we have to do here, I'm going to drop the 10 points, and I'm going to take the 49ers. Jeff Fisher, 4-1 and one against the number with the Rams as a divisional dog of seven or more. Not not the biggest sample size, but Jeff Fisher, certainly a good coach, been around quite a bit. Uh, my concern here is certainly all the injuries for St. Louis, and I will say this. If they hang around in this game, they are prime fade material next week when they take on Arizona. Uh, so I guess this week I'll take the Rams plus the 10. I'm not a big believer in San Francisco right now. I'm, I'm not sure that they're going to be able to blow out the Rams for the second time in three games. Uh, they won the game at St. Louis 31-17 to on Monday night, October 13th. Uh, I think the Rams make some adjustments there and really hang around. Uh, Denver and New England, a game that we covered in depth. Oakland and Seattle, a game that we talked about uh, as possibly a super contest play with the Raiders, so obviously that's our lean there. We just talked about Baltimore and Pittsburgh. So the final one to talk about, the Monday nighter, Indianapolis minus three against the Giants. You want to talk about interesting lines. The Colts' defense looked so bad last week in front of a national TV audience. Here they are road chalk against a team off a bye. Right. So what did I tell you? People thought that was a, a fluke, right? I mean, they're, they're still believing in Andrew Luck. It's quarterback league. I'll buy that. But to me, those other problems were huge. And there are problems that have existed, you know, throughout the season. They've just been able to cover that up. What, you know, the Colts have done is basically they don't have a pass rush. So what they will do is have a strong secondary to make up and give guys time to get in there. Well, now their secondary is banged up. Plus, like you said, the Giants are coming off a bye. Richard Jennings won't be back. They said he's not ready this week. But I still like Big Blue. Tom Coughlin coached teams 15-7 and seven straight up, 12-10 and 10 against the number. But the straight-up number is the one that key on because they're underdogs. Give me the Giants and a home win. Colts go limping into a bye with another loss. 
this line tells a story and the story tells me that I should like Indianapolis because this line definitely looks a little bit inflated. I'm kind of surprised there hasn't been a whole lot of movement in it uh, just because of how the Colts looked last week and, and the Giants coming off a bye. I think I'm going to take Indianapolis because of the context clues I see in the line, but I, I really don't love it. And in fact, very tough stretch here for the Giants. They take on India Monday night at Seattle next week, host San Francisco and Dallas back to back weeks. Uh, so definitely a litmus test for the Giants coming up here, and it'll be interesting to see how they handle it. That does it for the rapid fire rundown for this week. Last item of business, I already mentioned it uh, toward the top of the show, but Cole Ryan's fantastic NFL blitz on Sunday mornings at the Bang the Book forums. Thank you, sir. Every Sunday, two hours leading up to kickoff, I have all the information you need, the latest news, notes, injury, sports trends, sports betting picks, uh, I'll, I'll have updates on Romo and RG3 and all the big names, AJ Green, you name it, plus uh, picks and, and fun times and information galore. So stop by, bang the book, NFL Blitz, two hours before kickoff. Absolutely. And don't forget, you can see our full Super Contest card in the NFL Blitz right. and bang the book forums. Uh, Cole, any final thoughts from you for this week? I'm excited about the Super Contest. I like our 4-1 uh, uh, come back, I'll call it. And man, I'd love to see another one because the way I'm looking at the standings, we're just about two or three games out from being closer to the money and, and I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely. So am I. And as I said at the top of the show, the college basketball podcast, Handicapping the Hardwood comes back November 10th. That's a Monday. Make sure you tune in for that. And of course, our college football podcast every week on Wednesdays. Also, uh, included in the college football podcast yesterday, a link to subscribe to Bang the Book Radio on iTunes. And we've been putting these up over at YouTube. Uh, great production value in those. Uh, you know, it's definitely something that you uh, want to just play in the background while you're browsing around looking through NFL news and notes. So I'll do it for us this week. For Cole Ryan, I'm Adam Burke. Enjoy this weekend of football action, everybody, and we'll talk to you again next week.